This is Innovating Leadership, Co-Creating Our Future. I'm your host, Maureen Metcalf, founder and CEO of the Innovative Leadership Institute, where we help leaders be future ready. We're recording this interview from the 2023 International Leadership Association Global Conference in Vancouver. The ILA is celebrating its 25th anniversary. I am delighted to have with us the board chair of ILA, Mike Hardy. He's a founding director of the Center for Trust, Peace, and Social Relations, and Hippolyte Tiguruwa, a Yale scholar and PhD candidate in the center that Mike is the founding director for. Hippolyte's research focuses on rebuilding trust as a means for sustainable peace. In 2019, he became an international news item when he performed a 100-day walk across 1,500 kilometers of Rwanda to mark the 25th anniversary of the genocide, inviting people to join him and share their stories of peace and forgiveness. Hippolyte, let's start with you and your story. How'd you get here? Well, it's a journey. It's a journey of life. Finding myself a child survivor of the genocide against the Tutsi in 1994 in Rwanda led me to see the world as a different world, if you want to say. And all my work focusing on making sure, hopefully, that what I've seen, no child will see it, or what I've heard, no child would hear it. So my work has been like that, and I did sociology, always aiming to contribute to understanding of leadership and understanding of how leaders can prevent violence to happen. So I am at the LA because of the work I'm doing right now with research on trust and trying to see how you can rebuild trust or how you can build trust to prevent violence. Your story has more meaning when we understand what you went through, because as we think about genocide, most of us have an image of what that might be. But at least for me, I have no lived experience of it. It's what I read on the news. But beyond that, most of us have no idea. We don't see family members killed. And so would you be willing to share? Because I think part of what is so exceptional about your story is that you survived that and overcame and want to make peace versus being angry and turning into a militant or just someone who's struggling to survive. You've thrived. Thanks for describing that. I think there was just months after the genocide, life had to go on and I had to start my primary school. I was seven years old when it happened. So everything was really like living in memories and memories that still go on today and living that you say to describe it. Like I say, I was seven and I saw many people that I knew from my family, including my dad, being killed, being killed by the people I considered as neighbors and friends. And I was also a child, a child slave for the killers. Many children that we were with actually didn't survive. And for a hundred days, every second was, was a second of death. And we were always hoping to die in a non-misery way, which doesn't make sense. So. After all that horror living through, we're not talking about hunger. We're not talking about what I have seen as a child, seeing women that I knew, that I considered like aunts, I considered like sisters being raped. And you get out of that traumatized as a child and you are in school and you are being told science and maths and everything. You don't know what to do. You just live life. And so after that, in school, I didn't speak. Didn't speak at all. I was sitting in class, looking at a teacher. A woman would remind me, a woman I've seen being killed and all that, all those memories. So when I was 15, I was really tested as a young boy who's trying to really find the objective in life. But then the government has been supporting me. But then that time I was not able to find transportation to go to school, which was how many dollars, pounds, less than five. The frustration of young guy who wants to achieve, who put everything into education is what can save the world. I stopped going to school and I too started thinking of the ways I could become a killer and revenge for my family, for my father, for my relatives. Everything changed when I got helped. And along this story, that kindness of people made me see a world in a different way. 
And the Congolese medical doctor saw me not going to school and then he approached me and long story short, he helped me to go back to school. And I gave up on the plan to try and find a way I could become killer. So through education and everything and the kindness of my godparents who rescued us, who tried to help us in the genocide, all that kindness, all those things made me realize that what kills people is not just arms or guns. It's the ideologies that the powerful, the people of authority puts into lives of people. So that influenced my work. That influences my work and how really the, to invite people with authority and that means everyone to really, really think about the work they do, the, to be the peace instead of just talking about peace and walking as if peace is something different from the humanity that people have in their own. And that's, that's what guides my work. And that's why I'm looking into trust as a blue for uh, the society and sustainability of peace. And, and I think leaders need that. I love the phrase, be the peace. When we talk about leadership education in our work, we talk about who am I being, how am I relating, and what am I doing? And we show it as gears, the being being the largest gear. And I think people often think about leadership as the checklist of things I do. Just go to school, learn the checklist. I learn how to do crucial conversations and manage conflict. But if I am not being principled, if I am not being trustworthy, then I'm often a poor leader, even though I can execute the skills. You bring such an extreme example of being victimized early. How did you go from being angry, being scared, being hurt, to being the peace. That journey seems like you crossed a chasm, not walked across the creek outside. We tend to focus on being angry, on trying to do revenge and anger. But if you look back into the people, the heroes for me are the people and the leaders who try and be kind, who are kind, who are empathetic. We have stories of people in Rwanda who said no to killing and they were killed, who rescued Tutsi who were being killed and they were killed with them. And those are the heroes I, I look at in the situations of conflict or violence. And I think the kindness that I have been receiving from people and also education made me understand we're not just blood and fresh. The being is more than that. And whatever we put ourselves into understanding, that sentence has been always there. Or whatever you put yourself into, you can do it. But it never goes to being the peace, being kind, being empathetic. It goes only about having money or having earning that or earning this. But we forget that the best worth you can have is the joy, is peace, is the kindness. And those are the soft power that I'm looking at and I'm inviting everyone. Having witnessed the horror, the hardest part of humanity, the worst part of humanity, but also having seen the best part of humanity, I chose to go with that. And that what made me to forgive. Today, I go back to where my mom lives. And the people I see are the people who did that to me. They come back from prison. Today, they live in the same village. Do I hate them? How better would I be? if I hate them. And the way to stop the transmission of hate from one generation to another is to love, is to inherit love. And that's what I see and that's what I think. It's for sure, it's not even thinking I'm witness of that. When you transmit love, love is what grows. If you transmit anger and hate, then you can't hope for another result. I want to delve deeper because I feel anger about things and I didn't go through what you went through. And I've meditated, I do yoga, I've studied in a church, I've done a lot of things to overcome my past that wasn't nearly what you've endured. What's the process for you? And I, I know for each of us, it's different, but there's something else there. There's no defined like one thing that can do that. But the purpose, I, I think the purpose of what you want to be is what can drive it. Of course, you can be, we can be angry, you can be that. But how much do you go? How do you use your anger? How do I use my anger? How do I use, of course, the trauma is there. I can't say that when I remember about what happened, 
there's no sorrow, there's no grieving. It's there. But how do we orient? Where do we put our focus? How do we orient our anger? We experience racism, we experience misogyny, we experience all kinds of really not nice things. But where do we orient our energy is what matters, I think. And through the process, it can take long. I'm talking about Rwanda. We still have people who have, you know, wounds, who have not come to the terms of forgiving and who have come to the terms of not confessing. And all that is a journey. It's a journey. It's a process. But also the conditions that surrounds the environment we go in, the things we access, education is very, very important. Learning sociology and still learning again how things work. Being positive, I think it, it can help and try to find good things into people instead of just being an angry person. I love the idea that it's still there. It's where you choose to focus. Mm. And so, Mike, I interviewed you three years ago and you talked about finding the peace in yourself. You'd been running a peace center for a long time. But you talked about being a peaceful person, not a thing you do out there, but a thing you do in here. So I'd love to hear where you are in your own journey and how the two of you came to connect. Hippolyte's story is quite remarkable, and he's a remarkable man. Let me say that to start with. He's also a very good friend now. But when we met, it wasn't because of that story, interestingly. It wasn't because I was searching out for people with this special experience or say. I do that anyway. I'm always interested in learning from others. But it was following an initial meeting in which we had clearly shared interests about building a world which was better than the one that we have and the one that you look back at. And it, that co-joining of a sort of shared interest allowed us to bounce into each other. Now, it's just overwhelming that I have a relationship with someone who has some clear magical competences at being able to reflect and articulate the very point you've made about where you are. And peace starts within yourself. You could almost compile my career around a set of experiences, incidents, and stories. I try not to because I hope there is a little consistency in and, and, and where it's developed. But I certainly arrived in the later part of my career when I had the opportunity to build a peace study centre in Coventry, which is the UK's city of peace and reconciliation, and was doing a lot, but not enough, in my view, at that responsibility. And I then realised very quickly that actually I needed to sort out the peace internally before I could have any chance of encouraging, cajoling, enabling others to rally round. And it was meeting people like Hippolyte and a whole variety of people. I now better understand the concept of servant leadership, the subordination of my abilities and my wish for change to the power that other people have and that can bring. Where I'm now, well, in a recent session at this conference, I said I'm quite a cynical optimist. I'm really anxious about where we are. We are in a terrible place. The years I've spent hoping for structures and processes which would lead to more peacefulness in our relationships, more love in the way we relate one to another. You get into despair, don't you? This week we've seen the most savage recurrence of terrible atrocities by evil people. It knocks you back. It really knocks you back. But what it does also is reinforce how important the work we try to do in our small way. Three years ago, I referred to my journey that brought me into leadership and to the International Leadership Association specifically. I think that leadership provides us an opportunity if we get it right and we improve it and we think about it more to move at a faster pace. I still think it's going to be a challenge, as Hippolyte reminds me quite often. It's still difficult, but I've now got clear in my head that better leadership won't solve the problems. It won't meet all the challenges, but it will accelerate our movement forward. And bad leadership holds us back. And it amplifies the problems. It really makes them worse. Yeah. Barbara Kellerman's passion for toxic leadership and bad leadership for raising the profile is really important too. What I've found in this leadership community is a whole range of ideas, a whole range of conceptual thinking, evidence-based practice. And we can begin to interrogate these. And from our experience, Matt, where we are individually, in our person, to some of the big ideas that are out there and some of the small ideas there. 
And it's not surprising, of course, if we're humble enough to learn from the lived experience of others, we have a chance at moving forward because we can multiply those experiences and multiply those aspirations. One of the themes I've heard at the conference, you talked about it last night, people like you just mentioned it. I heard it from police officers. It was the word love. And that's not a traditional word we hear in leadership. It's certainly not a word that we hear from police people and folks like that. Someone who's had your journey, love is such a powerful word. And I'm curious how you define it. It's so funny that when we arrive in moments where we want to be powerful, or we want lots of material thing, we give up on the non-material thing, which when you think about everyone has a family, has the, where they are from. I'll give you an example. When I'm in Rwanda, I'm working with people whose parents were killed or people who were born as a result of rape. And those people, they're the smiling people you can ever meet. I visit people who were left with no one in their family. They were parents that they left with no partner, no child. What do they do? They give you a hug. If a person doesn't learn from those experiences, that's what I call love. And what do they tell you? Go and be nice. Go and do no harm. Whether you are in a difficult moment, whether you are, you are a survivor, the love comes when, when there's hate when there is difficulties, when there's violence. And those are the things that we forget to really emphasize. If you're a leader, you go on and and think about what you earn, what you you have, the decisions you make. But stop a moment and think about why do I think like this? Why do I do these things? If I was in the position and the empathy comes in, so that ability of saying, I've got to be nice always, I've got to be kind. And I'm not talking about not really doing defense or security. And I do understand all that. But if you are a police, like you said, if you are a military, if you are a woman, man, and everything, we all want to be loved. And do we love? Uh, That's a question. If we sit down and ask for love, everyone has the definition of love. It doesn't have to be defined for them or for anyone else. But Whatever you define as love, do you give that love? And that's the problem. That's the question everyone should ask themselves. And if we were being love and being peace instead of asking for peace and for love, I think that would prevail in every work that we do. I think that's important. I may be kind, but I'm, I also exact consequences. I can be firm So it's not this kind of, oh, it's all okay. I have to be very clear that that's not okay. And the loving response is to be clear and direct and in some cases extend consequences, Mm -hmm. including asking people to exit the organization for behaving improperly. So I I do want to draw the distinction that I don't have to be hateful, but I do have to uphold our standards and principles. Maybe that's the terminology. Mike, would you say more about that? It's how you frame the way you relate. You can frame it through a lens of anxiety or hate or dislike, or you can frame it as people like to describe through love. I think of it in terms of the terrible things I've experienced, the terrible conflicted places that I've been in my career. And you come back and you wonder, how on earth has that happened? And it's often happened the more you reflect, because players in these funny little games and on these stages, have put their humanity to one side. There is humanity in everything. And even if you find it difficult, there's a little bit in there. And what I think the importance of love in leadership is to find it within and pull it up to the front. Don't let it be crowded out by the transactional stuff, the needs, the ego, the power and everything else. Find it inside. So when you're working And thinking about leadership and how you can improve leadership in order to get to these places that we know generally we should be in and we want to be in. Oftentimes people say, well, Mike, explain what you're thinking. What sort of leadership do you want? And that's made me reflect in my current work on the sorts of things that I think are in short supply. So I do want a leadership that has many of the attributes that the wonderful authors that we have and the scholars that reflect on. But I want a leadership that incorporates things that I think 
we're losing at a rapid pace. In the current world, there's not enough love. Leaders and leadership generally is not driven through that lens. I think, and I also added in my current work, I think loyalty is gone. I think this is probably a consequence of the technological change, the way we relate to one another with technology and, and through technology. You know, so we're not as loyal as we used to be to institutions that matter to us, whether it's family, whether it's our bank, whether it's our university, our alum group. I detect this sort of shortage of the drive of loyalty, which is important. And it relates to a lot of the work on trust, of course, within loyalty. And thirdly, we're not that worried about loss anymore. Leadership makes decisions that have consequences for people and then they're all good. And, you know, Ronnie Heifetz at Harvard would tell you in adaptive leadership, we should put loss more central when we think about actions and adaptions. And I think that's really important. I'll give you one story which has really moved me. We have a problem in the UK at the moment, largely of our own making globally, of traumatized people who crossed the English Channel from France to the UK in search of a better life for their families. They may be traumatized by conflict, by discrimination, or they may just be economic migrants, whatever we call them. We do have a problem because it's an illegal process which has enabled many to create toxic images of illegal movement of people. Reviewing that can be better if you start from a frame of the humanity within those boats. So when a woman in Nika with her baby, stumbles out of the rubber dinghy on the shores of Britain. Do we think of them as criminals, as agents of disruption, or do we see them through the lens of humanity and love? That doesn't mean we necessarily approve of what they're doing, or we like them, or we agree with them, but the starting point is so much better and is so much more likely to lead to a sustainable better. What's the one thing people take when they leave their home as a refugee? The house key, there's, yeah, there's evidence from the research, you know. That same research also showed what they did in the hour before they left. You know, if you're forced out of your home in Syria or in Gaza now, at this very moment as we're speaking, large numbers of people are moving from North Gaza to South Gaza. That's the extent of the movement that's possible because they can't go beyond Gaza. I'm interested, what do they do? in the last hour before they actually move. And we found in the research that was done in the European theatre that they buried their treasure. This wasn't gold and silver or dollars. This was a family picture or a little stool that your mother had given you. And of course, what we interpreted from that was people's desire not to move and to return at some later point. It's not always the case, of course, but these things are about humanity and the humanity within. And I think they are wrapped up in this notion that Love matters, and our love of each other matters hugely. Humanity and humanness. We're going to have more migrants with the climate challenges. We're going to have more migrants with the economic challenges. We don't have a global migration policy. From the World Economic Forum, we know it's going to be a very large number, large percentage of humans over the next couple of decades moving, and they won't necessarily get to bury their treasure because it'll be underwater Hmm. or some other variation of not terribly inhabitable, and they probably won't be going back. There is such a call for us to rethink nationally and internationally In the next 20, 30 years, we are all going to be challenged with seeing the humanness rather than seeing other. So you're not an other because you're trying to come to the U.S. through the Texas border or dinghies into the U.K. How do we see the humanness first and also attend to our population and our population health? And there has to be a path for both. Because you don't just allow people to sit in a country that is no longer inhabitable. The humanness requires us to look at both those on the move and those receiving. The host country communities are really important as well, there's no doubt. But what this tells me is that the framing is all wrong. We're on the back foot. So most of our migrant policy, the global migrant policy, is responsive. We're not preparing for what is going to happen. And, you know, there are various stages, aren't there? We need to prepare and think about how complex that is. We need to respond when it happens. If an earthquake happens or a civil war happens, that's now. You have to respond. And we have to recover from the the trauma of the change. So we have to do all three things. And I don't think we do any of them well. And humanity will help us. Being human, framing it through the love of our fellow people. Humanity, this world is a very small place. 
the estimates are scary. In a very short time, a large number of people will be forcibly displaced, not because they want to be, but it'll be inevitable. Now, we know that, and even in my old years, why aren't we doing anything about it? Probably because we don't really care enough. I would certainly love to do something about it, but I'm not in a position to do that. I know it sounds harsh, Maureen, but I don't think we care enough about our planet, look what we're doing to it. And I think on this issue, we don't care enough about the plight of humanity. It's less fortunate than us. I don't intend to become too political, but the creation of a strategy around building walls as opposed to accommodation and building bridges inevitably reflects an uncaring approach to these problems. We just keep them out because we're okay. That's fine. We have labor shortages. So we keep them out, and yet then we don't have enough people, and we complain that we have inflation because of labor prices. Or we want to pick and choose. We'll take you lot in because you're dentists, and we need plumbers, and we need agricultural workers, but you're not over there now. We don't don't actually need you. Maybe we care, but we don't get it. Because of what we have consumed over years, you're born, you told this and do that, those are that, the other is like this, in this country are like this, this religion is like this. And then you just have one perspective and you probably don't get to think within and what humanity means from within. Does peace mean from within? We care about our children, but we don't get to understand about other children There might be something about also what we consume. You might find people consuming one media and that's it. And one school of thoughts or one ideas. And I think we have all stuff we can consume these days. And the idea of stopping and rethink, like Mike said, is important. And so probably it's caring, but not getting it. Or maybe getting it, not caring enough, but it swings in between. You see, Maureen, how much I learned from my friend here. And he corrects me, and he's right to correct me. It's not simple that people don't care. It's complex. And I don't make judgments about a lack of caring. But if you're not equipped to frame it in a different way, that's hard. We don't invest much in our education on encouraging global thinking, for example. And so... I was watching a podcast with a futurist talking to Accenture Global leaders And one of the things he talked about is how we are driven by the algorithms. So in the you don't get it and you're consuming space, so much of what we consume is now dictated by a choice we made. So during the pandemic, there was some comment about the Pope and some policy. So I clicked on that link and I forever got Catholic things coming into my feet. And it was interesting because I'm not Catholic, but the algorithm decided that I was very interested in all things Catholic. If we are consuming peace, I think we see more peace. If we are consuming what's happening in Gaza and Israel right now, that's all that comes into my newsfeed right now. I am interested, but I don't want war to be the prevalent message. It's why we have a conversation at home about the value of the Hallmark Channel. (laughs) It's fairly formulaic, but at least... There's not a lot of car chases. There's not a lot of people getting killed in violence. And what we consume on a daily basis, our physiology responds to. We do have remarkable scholarship in peace education now that has moved leaps and bounds in recent years. And the power of positive peace identifies the sorts of conditions that we need to put in place in our societies that are more likely to lead to peaceful relations than less likely. I've really been attracted by the notion that we can think of peace as an absolute. God be there. Not building peace, but building the conditions in which peace is more likely to emerge. Then the peace within is more likely to emerge. And that's the sustainable peace. Be the peace. But what works against that can be sometimes that the conditions for that are simply not in place. One of the conditions is control over a climate that won't force people to move. That's obviously going to be a problem and will not help people be to peace because they'll be traumatized by being in different places and they'll meet people who are traumatized because they've got all of a sudden large numbers of people that they didn't expect. The scholarship is good at the moment if we allow it to run its course and to work it through. The conditions for positive peace are becoming clearer in our understanding. Would you share a few others of those conditions? 
Because I think this is fundamental to the conversation. Heberlite referred to our consumption of news from single sources. So the conditions, I think, for positive peace were that we broaden our access to opinion and to sources. So we have a free press, for example, is critical. And a critical free press is, is also critical. Can we deal with the huge inequalities of resource allocation in the world? Why is it that even with the advances we've made to attack absolute poverty, we still have absolute poverty among huge numbers of people? That is a, a fundamental condition that where we have huge inequalities, people will seek to change their livelihoods and their life opportunities. So this democratic or some form of democratic government is important. So people have a voice and have some influence over the nature of the communities in which they operate. We could list them on, on and on. There are a set of conditions. And I think if we understand the conditions most likely to lead to peace, we should work on those, challenge the inequalities, challenge the resource distribution models that currently work. It won't be easy. And of course, every step forward we make, somebody loses. So we have to do it in a negotiated, humanistic way, in a way that puts people at the center, I think. I sound like an idealist, but it's possible. That's why I'm an optimist. And Hippolyte talked about the value of education being another in your life, and I would presume more broadly education and support, not just financial, but also emotional. And I didn't necessarily refer to schooling. The, the way we socialize, the way we get socialized, the way we get politicized, what do you teach as a teacher, as a parent, as a leader, as a journalist? Whatever you're doing, what are you giving instead of what you are asking? And if we were all giving this, then that's what we have. To build on what you just said, Hippolyte, what would you like people to give to create conditions for peace? It's empathy. Empathy and put yourself in place of someone you or other people. I think that's important, whether you are a leader, whether whatever you are doing, put that empathy into whatever you're doing, that will help. And Mike, what would you ask people to give to create these conditions? Love. I think we both share that very powerfully. And that your approach to the other should be one that's unconditional. You might be knocked off course by disapproval or by behaviours that are simply not acceptable. Absolutely not acceptable, so be clear. But approach with unconditional commitment to humanity, I think. Unconditional commitment to humanity. So let's end on that phrase. How would people learn more about your work? I think the Center for Trust, Peace and Social Relations at Coventry University is a great platform, some amazing work. But actually, it's through the networks of networks. When I first met Hippolyte, he was at the Jackson Institute at the Yale World Fellows. This is another superb organization that brings special people together. So have a look, you know, just begin to be curious, find out where people operate. Hippolyte is online and so am I, and, and we'll put each other together. But more often than not, we'll signpost you somewhere else to even bigger and better people than us. And YouTube has algorithms too. So when I look you up, both of you, I'll get more of you. Exactly. <laughs> we are there online. So LinkedIn for both of you. Yes. And also the work of Be The Peace. So you can search Be The Peace Global. Uh, you can find a lot more of the work we do in Rwanda and elsewhere about stopping the intergenerational transmission of hate. And the International Leadership Association is a great place. It's an eclectic place with amazing people and it's open arms. You know, once you get into it, you stay. Thank you both, Mike, for being the board chair. Keep a light for the work you're doing that's so precious and important. And I do want to thank the ILA for sponsoring our podcast. So to our listeners, thank you for joining us. And I do challenge you to find ways to be the peace. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.